Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook, and on our YouTube channel. I'm Mark Zitter, chair of the Zetima Project, a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, chair of the club's End of Life series, of which tonight's session is a part, and your moderator. The club's End of Life series, it started last year, and I know we have at least one prior speaker here tonight for that series, Dr. Rebecca Sidori, welcome. We began the series because we felt that although people don't like to talk about dying, it's important to do so in order to change end-of-life care in America. We have a, a real tragic situation where far too many people are treated to death with too much technology and too little humanity, and with unnecessary suffering, yet without the information they deserve to be able to choose the deaths they want. Tonight's speaker has much to say about this public health crisis. And uh, to start out with full disclosure, I should make sure you know that Dr. Jessica Zitter is my wife. <laughs> I introduced her publicly, actually, for the first time two years ago here at the Commonwealth Club with much trepidation. Uh, and I'm pleased to let you know that we're still married, which is a good thing. <laughs> uh, Jessica Zitter has become a national spokesperson on the over-medicalization of death and what we can do about it. She practices an unusual combination of specialties, both critical care and palliative care medicine. Uh, at Oakland, uh, Oakland's Highland Hospital, a public hospital there. Jessica is author of the new book, Extreme Measures, Finding a Better Path to the End of Life, from Penguin Random House. She's a regular writer and contributor to the New York Times and the Huffington Post, and her writing has also appeared in The Atlantic, Time Magazine, Journal of the American Medical Association, and elsewhere. Dr. Zitter has appeared on CBS Sunday Morning and National Public Radio's Weekend Edition, and this just in, next week she will headline a TV episode on Dr. Oz called The Death Show. How about that? <laughs> Committed to mainstreaming conversations about death, Jessica and her colleague, Dr. Don Gross, conceived a high school curriculum on death education that won top honors in the Open IDO End of Life Challenge and was piloted at two barrier hospitals, I'm sorry, high schools, two barrier high schools last month. These happen to be our daughter schools, so Jeff, Jessica obviously is truly committed to having at least our kids talking about death early and constantly. In fact, those of you who know us know that we talk about death a lot at our house, and so we're not invited out much, and it's very nice to be here tonight. <laughs> Again, underscoring, uh, uh, another, it's another initiative to underscore the importance of talking about death. Jessica was involved with the Oscar-nominated short documentary Extremis by filmmaker Dan Krauss, now streaming on Netflix. I'm going to say that again. Netflix, the Academy Awards. This is palliative care meeting Hollywood. It doesn't happen very often, and it was done in order to try to uh, highlight these conversations that we need to have. I'm pleased to mention, too, we have several other people here tonight who were involved with that film who I want to recognize. Dr. Monica Bargava and also Gordon Kaufman, both of whom are featured in the film, and Dr. Sean Ungerleiter, one of the film's funders. Let's give them a hand. Really important, but you know, to talk about this and to do everything we can. But when you've got this streaming on 190 countries to millions and millions of people, it really has an impact. And for that reason, I would like to just play you just the trailer for Extremis. How many people here have had a chance to see Extremis? Good, many of you have. Terrific. Uh, it can give you a very quick the trailer, just a quick and graphic sense of the challenges that patients and their families and their care providers, the healthcare providers, face in these difficult end-of-life decisions within the intensive care unit. And for those listening on the radio or on the podcast, you can see this trailer easily by searching on the internet, it's on YouTube, for Extremis Trailer, that's E-X-T-R-E-M-I-S. Here we go. Selena, can you squeeze my hand? Here's the reality, we're all gonna die. Everyone standing in this room is gonna die one day. And it's good to have a little bit of a say in how. I want to make sure that she knows that, that we've explored all the options. Every day, people are attached permanently to machines. My concern is we're going to cause more suffering sure. without likely benefit. The other approach is let her pass naturally. It would feel like murder to yeah. pull her life support. 
if I had to make the decision for myself, then take me off. And if I breathe on my own, then that's fine. That's God will. Amen. How would you feel if you were not getting better on a breathing machine? Good. I don't want to be on a breathing machine. It's his decision, but I don't want to see him go. We're going to support you through this. wake up from this in a meaningful way. Follow. Knowing at some point you got to get to that reality, and now it's here. Right. Please help me welcome Dr. Jessica Zitter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Come back with me to the year 2003. I'm a newly minted ICU doctor in my first month at my first job. It's a big inner city trauma center, and I'm in the middle of the action, and I love it. I have a patient with metastatic breast cancer whose kidneys are failing. The doctor wants to clean her blood using dialysis. It makes sense. I'm asked to insert a large catheter into her neck. I explain the risks of the procedure to the, to the husband, and he signs the consent form. Thanks for helping us, doc, he says. I swab the patient's neck with betadine. I cover her with drapes, and I put on my sterile gloves, and I get ready to insert the needle. And suddenly, I sense someone watching me from the doorway. It's Pat Murphy the nurse who runs the family support team at our hospital. The team's task is to enhance communication between patients and families in the ICU and doctors in the ICU. Frankly, I didn't think there was a problem with my communication. And every time I turned around, someone was telling me how to talk better to this patient or explain something a little bit differently. And so I kind of took what they said with a grain of salt. But now, Pat was standing in the doorway tapping her foot and glaring at me. And all of a sudden, she took her hand like it was a pretend telephone. She put it up to her face and she said, call the police. They're torturing a patient in the ICU. I was horrified. How could she think I would torture a patient? I was just trying to be a hero. When I was a little girl, I thought I was going to be a hero. I was going to be a doctor who would swoop in to rescue patients from the brink of death. I wanted to be like my father, my grandfather, my great uncles, my uncles. They were doctors who saved lives. They repaired brains. They delivered babies. In my mind, they were true heroes. Well, my friends were playing with Barbie dolls, I was playing with my father's doctor bag. I spent rainy afternoons splayed out on the floor exploring its mysterious treasures. And this was much more than a game for me. Those afternoons gave me a taste of what it was gonna feel like to be a doctor. And as I got older, I outgrew my fascination with my father's doctor bag, but I never outgrew my fascination with the idea of saving lives. And so I decided to pursue training in what I thought of as the most heroic of the medical subspecialties, pulmonary and critical care medicine. There was one day in my first year of training that I will never forget. I had just started my internship at a large hospital in Boston. It was 5 p.m., and I was post-call with 21 really sick patients. And I'd gotten 15 minutes of sleep the night before and was running on fumes. I was in one of my patients' rooms when I heard the words that I had been waiting for. Code blue, 11th floor. I was being summoned to save a life. Before I go any further, I should tell you that I had been waiting for this moment for years. Codes are the ultimate symbol of life-saving. Medical students prepare and rehearse for them over and over again. I would pull my dog-eared code study cards out of my pocket whenever I had a spare moment 
and go over them over and over again. I'd gotten to the point where I could handle any kind of cardiac arrest in my sleep. V-tac, V-fib, pulseless electrical activity, bradycardia. So now I ran out of my patient's room and I sprinted up the stairwell and I was pumped full of adrenaline. My protocols were all running through my head. Shock, 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 epi shock, lido shock, bertillium shock. Remember those old protocols? As I ran, I remember wondering, who were we going to save? Was it a 60-year-old man having a massive heart attack? Or a pregnant woman having a pulmonary embolism? I felt terrified. But I calmed myself down, remembering that I knew what to do. I had memorized these protocols backwards and forwards, and now I was finally going to get a chance to put what I had learned to good use. But when I saw the poor soul who would be the recipient of my first life-saving efforts, I was stopped in my tracks. The patient's skin was an ashy gray. There wasn't an ounce of fat or muscle on him. The stench of kidney failure filled the room. And everything I'd ever learned in medical school told me, this man is dead. But one intern after another was being summoned to perform chest compressions. I heard a crunching noise, and the resident next to me whispered, the whole chest is broken. Suddenly, the resident in charge shouted, Jessica, relieve Dara. I climbed up on the bed, and I knelt over the patient, and I locked my hands together, and I began to press on his brittle chest wall. I felt bone grinding against bone under my palms, and I was horrified. My resident said, more epi, and then try another atropine. Then he asked the recording nurse, how long have we been at this? 22 minutes, she said. Let's give it another eight to make it a full 30. I'll never forget those minutes. They crawled by. With every compression, the patient's chest clicked like an old clock. And finally, we reached our goal of half an hour, a number that showed we had tried everything. Nobody could say that we hadn't given it our best shot. Let's call it, my resident said. And suddenly it was over. I stood dazed at the bedside as the, the surgeon started to clean up. The nurses disconnected the monitors and the IVs. And then we all walked away. That day, I performed a code on a patient whom everybody knew would never survive. That man was so frail, so beyond recovery, and yet there we were at the end of his life, battering his body. I had expected to feel like a hero, but I didn't. I felt ashamed. The next few days were tough. I told myself over and over again, Code blues like that come with the territory. Get used to it. And so I kept going. And every time a patient's condition deteriorated, I followed my protocols and I escalated medical interventions no matter what the prognosis was. And now sometimes it worked. And I'd felt that thrill that I imagined as a young girl. But more often, code blues left me feeling disconcerted. And it would take another 10 years, and Pat Murphy accusing me of torture before I figured out why. So let's come back to that moment. Pat is shouting, call the police! And suddenly, out of nowhere, a wave of shame hit me. It was the same feeling I had after that first code blue. Because I'm realizing what I'm about to do it's not going to help this woman. It's not going to stop her from dying. It's just going to hurt her. But 
the dialysis nurse was right outside the room with the machine, waiting to connect it up. And the husband was in the waiting room, waiting for me to be done with the procedure. And the medical student was gowned up and waiting for me so that he could watch and observe this procedure. And I felt I just had no choice. And so I inserted the needle. Months of scrutiny by Pat and her team had gotten through to me. My beliefs were changing, and I didn't realize it until that day. Putting in that catheter didn't improve my patient's life, but it changed mine. That's Pat. Within a few days, I stopped seeing Pat as my nemesis, and I made her my teacher and my friend. She introduced me to what was then the relatively unknown field of palliative care. This was 2003. She helped me to realize that our prolonged life at all costs approach wasn't working for many of my patients. While it can work miracles for some, for others, particularly the terminally ill, the frail, and the dying, it can cause great suffering and distress. And yet, we tend to use it indiscriminately on everybody, by default. I'm convinced that the hero paradigm that originally drew me into medicine is failing our patients and their families. And I think it's failing doctors and other healthcare professionals too. And so I'm here to advocate for a new model of heroism. But to understand the new model, we must first take a good, hard look at the old one. The fantasy of immortality is almost as old as humanity itself. In my book, I write about the ancient Greek myth of Eos and Tithonus. Eos was the goddess of the dawn, and Tithonus was her human lover. Eos begged Zeus to make Tithonus immortal, and Zeus granted her wish. But as she was leaving his chambers, she realized her terrible mistake. She had asked for eternal life, but she hadn't asked for eternal youth. And this story did not have a happy ending. Eos spent the rest of her days caring for Tithonus as his body deteriorated and his mind became feeble. We want to live forever. We desperately want to believe that there is a magic pill or some miracle cure that will keep death at arm's length. Look at the popularity of television shows like ER and Grey's Anatomy. Why do we love them? Because each week, we get to witness at least one miracle of modern medicine. These doctors are pulling rabbits out of their hats. Who wouldn't want to have a doctor like that? Who wouldn't want to be a doctor like that? The world of modern medicine allows physicians to act out this fantasy. We rush in like firefighters with one purpose, to grab and rescue any form of life from the flames. Above all else, we must keep that heart beating. Now, as I've said, when this approach works, it's miraculous, and I know this from experience. It is the most exhilarating thing to sweep someone from the jaws of death and send them home to their family. But too often, patients who are truly at the end of life also get swept up into this life-saving fervor. And the result is devastating. I call it the end-of-life conveyor belt. It's the automatic, unquestioning application of increasingly powerful treatments and technologies that take over for the patient's organs as they fail one by one. Ventilators when the lungs fail. Dialysis when the kidneys start to go. Electric shocks or defibrillation when the heart starts acting up. Pressors or medications to keep blood pressure up when it's flagging. The body becomes completely dependent on, even encased in life support as it passes through the stages of dying. And the final stop on this end-of-life conveyor belt is not pretty. Long-term acute care or ventilator facilities. If you were to visit one of these facilities, you would see patients with tubes in every orifice, 
their arms tied down to prevent dislodgement of the tubes. And they go back and forth to our ICU to deal with a rotating set of increasingly serious infections that are the result of foreign objects permanently lodged in unmoving bodies. And as their deaths get stretched out, technology prolongs their suffering and increases their isolation. The term chronic critical illness describes patients who will be so debilitated as to require full-time care in institutions for the rest of their lives, often on mechanical support. A 2015 study found that of 3 million ICU admissions, 8% or 250,000 met the criteria for chronic critical illness. And the elderly are at much higher risk for this condition. And as our baby boomer generation is aging, the number of patients with this diagnosis is expected to skyrocket. So we're caught in the middle of a perfect storm. We have an unattainable fantasy, and we have the technology to chase it. We focus on keeping the organs alive, but we're looking past the patient in the bed. Did you know that 80% of people want to die at home, but only 20% actually get to do that? The rest are dying in hospitals, nursing homes, and healthcare facilities. 30% of people spend days in the ICU before they die, and that number's rising. And more than 60% of people are dying in pain, most of them needlessly. That's not the way I want to die. And most healthcare providers I know agree with me. Some of my colleagues have actually threatened to get a do not resuscitate tattoo on their chests. <laughs> and then a few years ago at a medical conference, I heard an ICU nurse say, they're not touching me. I got a tattoo. <laughs> and I looked at her skeptically, and she showed me this. <laughs> Most medical practitioners won't go this far, <laughs> but apparently many feel the same way. In a 2013 study from Stanford, 88% of over 1,000 physicians surveyed said that if they were terminally ill, they would choose a do not resuscitate order for themselves. And patients, when they're asked, feel the exact same way. More than a half of people surveyed said that being dependent on a breathing machine or a ventilator would be a fate worse than death. Let me repeat that. They thought it would be worse than death. So, there is something we fear more than dying, and that's dying badly. So now, I want to share a different kind of story. In fact, it's the epilogue of my book. And it shows us another way to care for patients who are approaching the end of life. Stephanie, do you remember her? Was a 60-year-old wife mother, and grandmother. She loved life, and she lived it to the fullest. Wine tastings, gardening, spending time with her family. And this didn't change when she was diagnosed with lung cancer. She signed up for all of the treatments that her doctor would give her, and she even stopped smoking. She made herself exercise more to keep up her strength, and she concocted a whole bunch of green smoothies to boost her immune system. When she learned that the cancer had spread to the other lung and to her brain, she took a deep breath in and went back into the ring. She signed up for more chemotherapy that was being offered, and she got a permanent drainage catheter that was going to drain the cancerous fluid from around her lung. She thought that if she worked hard, she could beat it. And no one had said otherwise. Even though lung cancer that has spread is not curable. But as the rate of fluid spilling into the space around her lungs increased, she used the drain more and more frequently, and soon her blood pressure fell dangerously low. 
And so I first met Stephanie in our intensive care unit as an urgent admission. She was in shock, her blood pressure almost unmeasurable. She was unconscious and mumbling incoherently. Her kidneys and her liver were barely functioning, and they were in a lot of distress. They weren't getting enough blood. We worked really quickly. Blood, fluids, presser medications. And we were lucky enough to be able to rehydrate her before her organs became permanently damaged. She woke up again slowly. And when we stood outside her room the next morning on rounds, my resident ran through all of the organ systems. They were all improving. This was success. We had saved her. Everybody was excited. But even though I wanted to celebrate with this family and send them on their way upstairs to the waiting bed on the regular hospital floor, I couldn't. Chemotherapy hadn't worked. And this cancer was just going to continue to worsen. Our fix wasn't going to change that. Yes, we had pumped up her blood pressure, but like a leaky tire freshly pumped full of air, it was only a matter of time before it would deflate again. The nurse walked up to me and said that the ER needed the bed and that they were ready for her upstairs on the wards. But she looked at me, and I looked at her, and I shook my head. And the nurse knew what I was thinking. We've got to tell her the truth. She nodded. I'll wait to call report. Stephanie's daughter, Becky, was giving her a pressure point massage when I walked in. And it was like she was a manager getting her boxer ready to go back into the ring. We're ready to get back in there and fight, Becky told me. Bring on the chemotherapy. Stephanie looked tired, but she nodded. I took a deep breath, and I sat down on the side of the bed. Becky looked at me warily, as if warning me to keep it positive. In fact, they had a sign up in the room that said, good news zone, literally. I was really nervous. What would they say when I gave them the bad news? Would they be crushed, angry? Would they feel like I'd failed them? It almost felt cold and uncaring to focus on the negative when we had just had a win. Why couldn't I let them be happy for a while? They were tired, they were exhausted. Didn't they deserve a break? But I remembered Pat and how she had held me to the truth and made me practice breaking difficult news over and over. And so I took a deep breath and I began. I explained that it was only a matter of time before Stephanie's organs would fail again. The next time, she probably wouldn't be this lucky. I explained that if we continued along this aggressive path, there was a very high likelihood she would die on machines. When I said the word die, Becky glared at me. Her hands paused. Stephanie's mouth, the corners of her mouth drooped down, and I wasn't sure if she was about to cry or yell. And then they calmly kicked me out of the room. Please leave, Becky said. I felt shame. I was not the doctor they had been hoping for. I wasn't their hero. Two days later, I went upstairs to check on them. They were on a floor team now, and I was no longer responsible for the case. But I worried that I had upset them, and I wanted to check in, and I was dreading it. But when I reached the room, I got a big surprise. There was Stephanie, sitting in a wheelchair, smiling. She was talking to her daughter on an iPad, which you'll see in a second because I have a clip of it. And it looked like she was getting ready to go home. And it turned out they had done a complete about face. So here's a clip of that moment. Looking at my bed set up in my living room at home. Yeah. And um, it's one of the hospital beds, but my daughter has got it fixed with my quilt from home, which is my favorite one to sleep under. And here's the, di the dining room where we can all sit and, and visit and then write 
next to it's the, the room with the bed and everything. So if you're tired, you can just, just lie walk, down and I your whole just, family's around and you. And still be, the, the dining room table has room to extend out so everybody can come and still visit. And I cannot wait to get home. You tell me what bottle of wine you want, Mom. I'll crack it open let it start raining right That's now. That's right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I want something nice. Um, so we'll start with a light red one. And then we'll also pick a heavier red one for later in the evening. Do the things that we love to do. He went, retired early. My daughter's quit her job so that we can, my son said, I can take a day here, here. I can take long weekends. I can meet you. I'll fly wherever you are, you know. That is. So that we can spend this last year doing the things that we love to do. I had no idea that I had choices or the power to say, no, I don't want to do this. I want to do this. Or, or I didn't know these options were out there. I want to... Um, a glass of wine. Have a a glass of wine. wine. Good. Fruit, little cheese, sit uh -huh. on my dining room table, Aww. and talk with my friends and my family. That alone brings me back into my social life. You mean you, you're not going to want to sit here in this bed here? Mm -hmm. uh, no. Joe, what do you think? Ever done. Bringing power to people like me that I didn't know I had that kind. I didn't know I could still a doctor, though. Yep. 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 Well, I yep. didn't, you know? Yeah. yeah. They had heard what I told them, even though it didn't feel like it in the moment. They had met with hospice, and they were set up to go home. No more hospital. In fact, they chose Cabernet over chemo. <laughs> Stephanie enjoyed her last month of life with the support of hospice, her family, and several bottles of good wine. Her funeral, which I attended, was filled with wonderful stories and not an ounce of regret. Stephanie's last couple of months could have looked very different. She could have stayed on until the last stop on the end-of-life conveyor belt. But instead, she stopped the belt, she jumped off, and she set her own course. We couldn't save Stephanie's life, but we did save her death. And I have come to see that as a new kind of heroism. Most patients aren't as lucky as Stephanie, but I believe that her experience should be the rule rather than the exception. How can we get there? Well, I have a few suggestions. First, let's expand our definition of success. I used to believe that success could only mean continuing to fight the disease and winning. And our patients follow us into battle if that's the only option that we give them. But as you saw with Stephanie in the video, she wanted another option, a different path to success. Second, let's do our homework. What would success look like to you in your last days, weeks, or months? And what about for your patient if you're the doctor or the nurse? Healthcare providers, we need to ask. And patients and families, you need to tell us. So here are some of the questions that I think are helpful to answer and to ask. Where do you want to be when you're dying? Who do you want to have at your side? How important is it that you're able to communicate cognitively, emotionally, physically? And how do you feel about being on life support, like ventilators, breathing machines, dialysis, feeding tubes. Third, we need to be honest. There is a huge elephant in these hospital rooms. Doctors and patients are living in completely different realities. Here's some data that shocked me. I want to share it with you. This is about patients who were on the verge of receiving tracheostomies because they were going on to require long-term breathing machine support. The loved ones thought that the patient would do really well over the following year. 93% of them thought they'd be alive, 71% thought that they'd be living independently, and 83% thought that they would actually have a good quality of life. But the physicians thought differently. The discrepancy is chilling. 
Although the physicians were much more accurate, it was the family members who were entrusted to make the commitment to a tracheostomy. Doctors, we need to tell our patients the truth. They cannot plan for a good death if they don't know they're dying. I believe that doctors need to practice these communication skills the way we practiced for our code protocols, with dog-eared study cards. And honesty is a two-way street. Patients, people, you have an important role to play. You must be open to the truth. Do you want to know what your doctor's really thinking? Or would you just prefer to hear good news? These are important questions. One study in JAMA Oncology recently showed that patients like doctors who give good news much more than they like doctors who give bad news. <laughs> and everyone, even doctors, wants to be liked. Patients who imply that they only want positive news are likely to get just that. And that won't protect you from the end-of-life conveyor belt. I almost didn't go back into Stephanie's room before I discharged her upstairs, and I'm a palliative care physician. I struggled with telling her the truth, but leveling with her enabled her and her family to take hold of their situation. To me, this is the most important work we can do. It's at least as important as saving lives. And last, we need to change the way we're making decisions for seriously ill patients. Currently, doctors are the captains of this decision-making ship, but we really need help. Let me tell you about a colleague of mine. He had a patient who was dying, and every day, things were getting worse, despite the team's best efforts. But they were in full court press mode. This was a young patient, and they wanted to give him every chance of surviving. But over several days, it was becoming clear to my colleague that this was not something that would turn around. They were not making progress. And he suggested a change of approach to his team. But everybody remained silent. He confessed to me later that he felt judged and alone, and he worried that he thought that they might think he was weak. And then he did something ingenious. He took a loose leaf sheet from his binder, and he ripped it up into eight equal pieces, and he passed one out to each person on the team. He asked each person to write anonymously on their sheet of paper from, on a scale from one to 10, how likely it was <laughs> that this patient would make it out of the ICU. And guess what he discovered? The entire team believed that this patient would never leave the ICU and that he would die on this admission but nobody was willing to say it out loud. The stigma about giving up is that oppressive. You wouldn't suspect that my colleague, a highly experienced ICU physician, would need emotional support from others, especially his trainees. But he did. And I've been there too. You've already heard me talk about how I placed that catheter in a patient's neck even though I knew it wasn't going to help her. When you're an ICU attending, everything is propelling you in the direction of life-saving. You're revved up, and so is your team. You feel locked in, even when things are dawning on you, when it's dawning on you that things aren't going to turn around. If there's a culture of conversation and reflection, you might have a better chance of steering the direction of care in the appropriate way. So doctors should not be making these tough decisions alone. But another argument for more collaboration is that one person can't possibly know everything there is to know about a patient. Are there any ICU nurses <laughs> in the audience? One who I work with. In my experience, it's usually the nurse who knows the patient the best. You're at the bedside, minute to minute. You know a lot more than I do about really important things. The patient's pain and anxiety, the family dynamics, the overall stage of acceptance of illness. But too often, this gold mine of information is going untapped. Bedside rounds are busy. We all have different roles. The doctors are focusing on writing orders. The nurse is administering them. We're focusing on keeping hearts beating. And we're ignoring crucial information that nurses, 
chaplains, social workers, and other healthcare professionals have about the patient. And let's not forget the most important source of information, the patient and the family. So it's true that in emergencies, we do need roles to be clearly delineated, to have one designated person leading the charge. But most of what happens in an ICU is not an emergency. And it was a nurse, Pat, who taught me how to be the doctor that I strive to be. So if we stick to this hierarchical approach where the doctor's driving and the patient is in the back seat and everyone else is coming along for the ride, we're just going to keep making wrong turns. And more and more patients were going to land on our end of life conveyor belt. So these four steps will go a long way towards creating a healthier ecosystem for all of us, not just for patients and families, but for the healthcare providers caring for them. And this new system, this new heroism, will allow more people to die like Stephanie. The way that we treat dying patients in this country is simply inhumane. It needs to change. And the truth is, the next time, it's not going to be Stephanie or some other patient in the bed. It's going to be you, or it's going to be me. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? I truly believe that if we work together, we can create a new kind of heroism, one that will ultimately save us all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a well, thank you, Jessica. <laughs> we have time for some questions, and Bill Grant is good enough to pass some of those up to me. If you have questions, please put them on your cards. I'm going to ask the first one uh, that I came up with myself. But first, I'm going to tell you this. You are listening to the Commonwealth Club of California program, and our guest today is Dr. Jessica Zitter, an expert on end-of-life issues and author of the new book, Extreme Measures, Finding a Better Path to the End of Life. I'm Mark Zitter, your moderator for the program. You can hear the Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, catch up with program videos on the club's YouTube channel, and find us on Twitter and Facebook. Okay, first question here. Uh, I understand that we can't ultimately prevent death. However, why wouldn't I want to give these terrific medical technologies a try if there's even a tiny chance that it could save my life? Many people, I think about the lottery analogy, many people buy lottery tickets. We know there's a very distant chance we're going to win, but still we want to play the lottery because there's a pretty big upside. Why wouldn't one want to do that in the ICU? The lottery analogy just doesn't it doesn't work in this situation because in a lottery, the upside is you win a million dollars, the downside is you lose five bucks. Mm -hmm. When it comes to death and dying and the end of life conveyor belt, the upside is that you'll come up with a miracle cure and somehow you will <laughs> defy all odds and be released back to your life, which would be wonderful. But the downside is a life that I've described to you on the end of life conveyor belt, which is filled with profound suffering um, and things that we know people don't want. So there's a downside that's very likely uh, that's uh, a big negative. Yeah. So people had some questions that are related to that whole issue, and it really goes to your first sort of, maybe your first step about redefining success. I'll try to uh, combine a few of these questions, but basically it's, uh, if you say sometimes, uh, treatment does work, uh, um, how do you figure out whether to treat or not? Uh, whom do you try to, try to save? And someone had a more specific one saying, for instance, let's say you had a diagnosis of cancer and uh, um, in order to combat it, what odds would you need to have of five year success in order to try to really go whole hog and risk what you're talking about for downside? Excellent question. It's totally personal. It, it's, it's, it depends on who you are. I mean, everyone's gonna have a different you know, this is so individualized, which is why we've got to be having this conversation so much more frequently, because every single person is going to have different willingness to accept different risks. Um, for some people, you know, the idea of having any inability to physically care for yourself is completely unacceptable. I've met many people like that. For other people, that's not a problem. If they're cognitively intact, that would be an accept, they, they would be happy to live. It's so personal, I mean, I, 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 and it changes over, over time too. You know, your, your feelings, uh, 
when you're young might be different from your feelings as you get older. Your feelings when you're healthy might be different from your feelings as you advance in an illness. So it's a, it's a constant revisiting of what your priorities and preferences are um, to consider each treatment option as it comes up and decide whether or not you're willing to take the risks and benefits. That's a key point because um, you don't want someone to misconstrue your message as they should not go on to the end of life conveyor belt. The key is people should be fully aware of it and what their risks of are getting there and make their own decisions. Well, let me actually right. clarify. No. What is the end of life conveyor belt? It's only when someone's on that trajectory and doesn't want to be there. I have definitely met patients for whom continued life prolongation with what I would consider a poor quality of life is completely acceptable. And that is not the end of life conveyor belt. To me, the end of life conveyor belt is the default application of life prolonging treatment in someone who may not want that, in whom you, it's just default. You, you haven't had the conversation and you don't know if they want it or don't want it. For people who have actively chosen that they want that, I don't consider that the end of life conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the second step. This is very nice. People, uh, first of all, I should apologize. We will not get through all these questions. We've got marvelous, many marvelous questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Uh, but also, people are doing a nice job sort of paralleling some of your recommendations. So I think the second one was about prepare, right? And there's some questions about that that I think are, are great. Rebecca Sudori. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, these two are sort of related. One is, how do you save yourself from this bad end you talk about in terms of what papers do we need to sign? Is the advanced directive sufficient? And second, if your biggest fear is dying in pain, which as you say it is for many people, what's the best way to communicate this to your doctor and what can the doctor do to ensure a relatively painless death? Well, I mean, I think it's a really, these are really important questions and these are the questions that people really care about when they actually start to see, oh my goodness, wow, I really need to be activated here and do some things. Um, I, in my book, I have a resources page um, and one of the top resources that I recommend is Prepare for Your Care, which is run by Dr. Rebecca Sudori, who's somewhere in here. I don't even know where she is, but anyways, there she is. Um, and I think that's a great first step. Uh, an advanced directive is not enough. It's a good start, um, but it's a very high level, uh, first blush approach, one point in time where you're saying, oh, you know, I feel that I would want to be kept alive regardless of quality of life, or I would not want to be kept alive if the quality of life is not acceptable. It's too high level, it's too one time, one and done. It's, it's a good start, it gets you thinking, but this, this is a process that has to be repeated and revisited and talked about with your loved ones and fleshed out in a nuanced and three-dimensional approach. And I do think there's several resources out there that can help you do this, but you need to do it in a regular, uh, inter time interval, not just once, not just take an advanced directive and put it in your safety deposit box. It, it's a lifelong process of, of talking about death with your loved ones that will get you where you want to be. Great. Well, there's some questions about that, talking about death with lo your loved ones, because it's a hard thing to do, as yeah. you pointed out. Yeah. So uh, two related questions. Do you have an opening line on how to begin that conversation mm. with a family member, you know, where death is nearby? Yeah. And, um, how do you handle a situation when family members want everything done when you feel like that would be a cruel thing to do for the reasons you discussed? Yeah, these are, I mean, these are such important questions. I wish we had more time to talk about them because, you know, first of all, there are, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to buy my book, but I will say in my book, I have many different resources and steps to start the conversation. There are several different approaches. There's games, there's something called Go Wish, which is a great card game that can make it kind of fun. There's, as I said, prepareforyourcare.org, right? Which is a great website to go to that's very helpful. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's a variety of different kinds of things online, which Honestly, uh, my mind is blanking, but there's many different approaches. It's hard if someone's all of a sudden sick and you don't, you haven't talked about it, and you know, you're, 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 God forbid, your mother's sick, and you kind of want to talk to her about it, but you don't want to say something because you're afraid she's going to feel like you're making her, you know, you're trying to bump her off. Who knows what the family dynamic is? It's tough, but I would say you err on the side of talking about it. Um, I've talked about it with my parents who don't love to talk about it, but we've, as we've talked about it over the years, because I've been writing about this stuff, they've gotten more comfortable. Even my father sometimes talks about it with me, but you have to just start. And I would recommend starting early before people get sick, before people get older. This is something that should be happening 
in high school, in young newlyweds. Dawn Gross, who's not here, one of my colleagues, does it every year on her wedding anniversary with her husband. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's, it's got to be pulled in. We've got to make it part of our life, you know, part of our lifelong discussion. It's hard to start it when someone just gets sick. Then it is more sensitive. You're right. Yeah. Did, yeah. Was that answering that question? I think so. And the, the flip side or the, the, uh, the, the, yeah, but the far end is a question about have you or your patient's families ever regretted the decision when they say, <clears> okay, <throat> I'm going to leave the end of life conveyor belt. I'm going to have a peaceful death and so forth. Have they ever regretted that decision? I've never known anybody to re regret it. I don't know if any of the other physicians in this room have. <coughs> um, I have never known anybody to regret it. I think what people feel when they make decisions is that they're empowered, they feel autonomy, they feel control, and I think that's what people want. And so I've only seen it's not to say that I haven't had situations. In fact, in the movie, you'll see a situation where there was polarization and trying to have the conversation with a family made it more tense and more uncomfortable. I still felt that it was the right thing to try to have the conversation with this family, but sometimes it doesn't go where it would go if it were me. You know, if I were the patient, I would, but that's okay too. It's, it, I still think that the conversation needs to happen. But no, I haven't seen anybody regret uh, deciding to stop the end. And I'm seeing some shaking heads here of people I work with who agree. So. Uh, two, I guess I'd call them related questions. One is from an internist who says that most of this person's middle class, well-educated patients are open to do not resuscitate and, and having more peaceful natural death, but her, uh, his or her elderly Chinese patients, it's, it's against their culture. And how do you deal with the cultural concerns? We had a similar question about how do you deal with it if patients don't speak your language, mm -hmm. don't speak Spanish or mm -hmm. Korean or something? This is, there's so many different variables that come with every human being and every family system that can make it, you know, more complicated, less complicated to communicate. I haven't, I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't found there's some tendencies cultural, religious, but in general, you know, people say to me, oh, do religious people always believe in miracles and not want to stop treatment? No, not at all. I, I don't know of any real variables, whether they be racial, li linguistic, religious, that have made all of one group feel a certain way. And I have always felt that uh, there's so much variability that, that you never know what you're gonna find. Um, and, and the conversation should happen. Uh, if, if possible, if the family's open to it. I mean, you can't force yourself on people, but most people are willing to talk a bit and, and, and get, as, you know, get more information. And certainly, and linguistically, at Highland Hospital, where you work, there's many languages spoken, yes. and you usually are able to, to access an interpreter. Well, that is right. something that's very important and that you should all know. We must get interpreters. It's, you know, sometimes we just can't find an interpreter, but we're, we have very good interpreter services, and we almost... You really, you know, there have been a few times when I have not done what I should do, and maybe I've used a, 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 a family member to interpret, and, and that's not ideal. You really need to have a professional interpreter doing the interpreting, um, and I think that's sort of best practices approach. Mm -hmm. So if, if you know somebody who I speaks a different language, they should be insisting on having professional interpreters in the room. It's very, very important. And these are very important conversations to get right. And going through family members can be very, can, can garble the message. Okay, here's someone who totally buys your story, hook, line, and sinker, says, great, I want to create an advanced directive that assures I get what I want, and if I'm in a car accident, I'm healthy now, but if I'm in a car accident or something else uh, and go somewhere, how can I make sure you just said advanced directives are only a starting place? Mm. What, do I, what do I do? Mm. Um, the mo in my opinion, the most important thing, I mean, I think an advanced directive is important, so I'm not saying don't do an advanced directive. I think it's a good first step. If you're going to be going by advanced directives, do advanced directives with some regularity. Do them yearly, and then, if you know more frequently, if you're if you're ill, um, or maybe starting out when you're young and healthy, do them every five years. But do not think of it as a one and done. It's not a one and done. Um, the other thing, and more importantly, is tell your loved ones. Figure out, and this is part of the very important role of an advanced directive. Identify who's going to speak for you. That's important. Who is the person who you trust to speak for you if you can't speak? Who understands your preferences and your values? You have to have somebody who's going to speak for you. 
if you can't speak. So that person needs to be identified, and that's what you do on an advanced directive or on Prepare for Your Care or other websites like that. Get that legally done, figure that out. Don't leave it to chance. Find that person and then make sure that that person knows what you care about and what's important to you so that if they're acting as your surrogate, they're really doing the best possible job of getting you what you would want if you could speak. I'll just add one other thing that we've seen increasingly, and that is people who pick up their phone, talk into their phone about what they would want for two or three minutes, and put it in their medical record. And it's very convincing, particularly when you have that, that brother who you haven't talked to in a while who flies in from out of town and you can't talk for yourself and says, this is what we should do, and the doctor can actually see no you giving your wishes in your medical record. So that's technically very easy these days. And I'd well, it's, it's easy, but yeah. how do you make sure it gets accessed? Right. Because we have, you know, people fill out at advanced directives or pulse forms, and they frequently don't show up, and the, or, or a pulse form shows up after someone's, I haven't talked about a pulse form, is a physician order for life-sustaining treatment, something that's, it's an active doctor's order that says, do not resuscitate this person, do not intubate this person. We frequently have patients for whom those forms don't show up until after they're intubated. So you, you have to make sure that it's, it's really, you don't just do it, or you don't just do your advanced directive and put it away, or you don't just do your recording and have it on your phone. It's gotta be, people have to know it's there, and it has to be clear to your family that it's, it's, a, it's there to but access. It's not necessarily representative, but because you work at an inner city hospital and so forth, but how often for your patients is there an advanced directive accessible for you to use? Never. <laughs> Almost never. <laughs> Would you, what? Rarely. 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 Very rarely. 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 Okay. And even in the, I mean, how, what's the percentage? I mean, 18% of people have advanced directives, uh, Rebecca. I, it's, it, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. 20 and 50%. It's low. And if you do have it, you've done the first step of your homework, but it's, not all of it. It's an important first step, but. Okay, we had some questions about some of the maybe possible darker motivations about this, why people keep treating and treating and treating people to death. To what degree are there concerns about uh, legal liability for doctors? And to what degree, degree is, are there financial incentives? Yeah, well, I think they're both real. Luckily, I have never worked in a place where I have felt any financial, uh, I, I don't get compensated. But I will say that I still do billing. Okay, even though I don't personally get paid more if I do an extra bronchoscopy or if I do an extra line, I still check off a box at the end of the day when I'm doing my billing. That affects you. I'm not getting paid for it, but it's making me feel like I'm doing something valuable. And so I will say something <laughs> political, which <laughs> is we just started paying at the beginning of 2016 for doctors, a tiny amount by the way, for doctors to be able to check off a box and say, I had an end-of-life conversation with somebody. Mm. It was $68, I think, for a half an hour, yeah. but it was something. <laughs> and it was that, it, again, it wasn't about the money because it was that checking. I was like, oh, I did that. Okay, that was valuable. That's valued. Guess what? Representative Steve King of Iowa or Idaho or something is now trying to get that repealed. Mm. That would be a major step backwards. Yeah. Maybe somebody you want to talk to. Maybe, maybe he needs to see your movie. So forth there, too. Uh, there were several questions here. Um, well, let me, there were a couple of questions here about sort of academic medical centers, believe it or not. And do you think that physicians in teaching hospitals or academic centers are more or less likely to have these difficult conversations? Or do you think that's not a relevant variable? You know, I was just, I'm not going to say the name of this hospital, but it's a very famous hospital in Boston. <laughs> well, there's a few of them, remember, so yeah. And my aunt, my <laughs> uncle, was just in the intensive care unit. He, almost, he, he was very sick. And my aunt, who's a very educated PhD from Harvard, came to my talk last week in Boston. And she said, you know, listening to you talk, I, nobody talked to me about anything at the fanciest of hospitals, mm -hmm. okay? So this is not, this is interesting to me because it's not specific to the hospital. I think our little county hospital in Highland, you know, in Alameda County does a pretty darn good job. Yay! <laughs> yeah. And um, so I don't think it's hospital specific. I think it's culture specific. And I think, you know, you, 
culture change is depends on the people there. It doesn't necessarily depend on the pedigree. And um, I think we're doing some pretty good stuff at our, at our hospital. Wonderful. Uh, I know it's a topic you don't like to talk about, but since I got three or four questions on it, a uh, number of people want to know about your views on doctor-assisted suicide. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to necessarily tell you my views about that, but I will tell you something interesting, which is that I find it so interesting that people always ask palliative care doctors that question. I wonder why people think that palliative care is necessarily associated with physician assisted death or aid in dying. Um, and what's interesting, I mean, I am an ICU doctor too. So I, you know, the idea that, that just because I'm a palliative care doctor, I would immediately believe in, in, in aid in dying is interesting to me. Um, what I do believe in is autonomy and control and people having the power to choose the way they live right until the end. And what I've experienced as a palliative care doctor is that really I've pretty much always been able to successfully help patients live the way they want to live until they die without, without having anybody ask about hastening death. Now, I know it's a new law in California, and I'm not, I, I believe in autonomy, and I, I'm still, <laughs> like many of my palliative care friends, working out exactly how I feel about it. It's, 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 it's sort of a little bit um, uncomfortable for me. But, um, but I think it's, it's the law, and I do believe in people getting access to the things that are important to them, and I hope we can get people more comfort and, and enhancement of their life and their quality of life uh, as best as possible. Great. Here's a question that says, your message and movie are both wonderful. How do we spread the word that everyone should see it and have the conversation? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I hope you can all help me. Um, I really, you know, I'm a zealot about this topic, as most people who know me know. And I really believe that um, this is just going to take, it's a sort of a grassroots movement of empowerment. I think we all want that. Um, there are many of us in this room who are working towards that, and you can all help us. <laughs> That's how I would put it. Great. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the point in the program where we have time for just one last question. And I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and ask it. How has your work in palliative care changed the way that you think about your own death? Hmm. Well, um, I don't, one of the things that is interesting, again, as a palliative care doctor is that people always think I want to talk about death. Oh, I just read this great article about death, and oh, I don't like, I don't particularly like death either. <laughs> um, I'm sad when I talk about my own death. I'm sad when I think about my parents dying. Um, death isn't something I love or I'm attracted to, but I do know, and maybe this is my ICU training coming out, how important it is to maintain control of your life and not hand it over to someone else or some protocol. And uh, that is why I want to maintain control of my life all the way to the end, and I don't want some person making decisions for me um, that aren't based on my preferences and values. So I don't know if that answered the question very well. It, it, it answers it very well. Okay. <laughs> so our, our thanks to Dr. Jessica Zitter, a critical care and palliative care physician and the author of the new book, Extreme Measures, Finding a Better Path to the End of Life. We also want to thank our audiences here in San Francisco and on the radio, television, and the Internet. I'm Mark Zitter of the Zetima Project, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>